Lauren Levin and I'm in the live room with Will Butler. Thank you very much for being here, Will. Oh, any time, any Cheers. Um, I woke up this morning quite early and the first thing I saw was your, uh, your tweet going, we are driving <laughs> through the night <laughs> to get to you. So thank you very much for that. Oh, yeah. It was our pleasure. How's the tour so far? So far, so good. Okay. Yeah. So I think a couple of UK dates, but quite a few American dates before that. Is that right? Yeah, we did. We did kind of East Coast America. We mm -hmm. did the continent. <laughs> now we're doing the UK. <laughs> And uh, then we're, about, we're going to do the West Coast in May. Okay, brilliant. And, and Manchester last night, obviously London tonight as well. Um, so policy's out now. How are people reacting to it? So far, so good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, people, people seem to enjoy it, seem to get it. <laughs> yeah, it's a fantastic record. I mean, what made it the right time to, to do a solo album? Um, I'm still young. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. Yeah. Uh, I mean, primarily it was the songs were ready to go, mm -hmm. and there was pressure from the songs. And then my name existed because of the Oscar nomination. It's like, oh, yeah, oh we'll, that, yeah. Oh, that old just... thing. <laughs> it's like an American BAFTA. Um, <laughs> I but mean, yeah, so then Will Butler existed as an entity. I was like, I've got songs, I've got a name, let's do this. Yeah, let's do the show right here. <laughs> well, I'm going to have to ask about the Oscar nomination. I was obviously going to ask about it later, but I mean, what an incredible thing. So you were nominated with Owen Pollock for the soundtrack to Her, to Correct. Spike Jones's film Her. I mean, did you think you were in with a chance when you were working on that project, or did it cross your mind that that might happen? Uh, when the movie turned out as good as it did, I was like, oh, now there's a chance. Mm -hmm. If this was like a three-star movie, maybe, but a four-star movie, <laughs> like, we're, we're golden. So what was it like then? Did you go? I mean, what, did, you, did you get to go to the ceremony or what? Uh, yeah, me and Owen went down a little early. There was like a, he conducted the orchestra for a, like a performance a couple nights before. And then we hung out with all the music people, and which was really fun and hilarious. Wow. Uh, so and what are the Oscars music people? Like? The other nominees, do you mean? Or the people who do the music for the ceremony like the itself? the Society of Film Composers oh, and the other nominees and stuff. And it was, it was really fun. We made pretty good friends with Alexander Desplat. I was, I was glad he won this year. So was it like, um, you know, there's that great uh, Seinfeld quote about when he sees like other, other comedy writers winning awards and he's like, that's my tribe. Was, <laughs> it, was, was there a sort of sense of that about meeting the other, you know, the other kind of musicians who are in that world? Uh, when Stephen won, he went up and then Alexander came up to me, you know, and he put his arms around us and he said, and now let's go drink bourbon. <laughs> <laughs> you were like, yes, these are my people. My fellow losers, let's go drink bourbon. No, oh, but how fantastic. I mean, what a fantastic thing to be to be nominated. And then, yeah, exactly, as you say, to give you an excuse to do this brilliant record. So um, we'll talk a bit about the album in a minute, if that's OK. But we'd love to hear some music uh, from you, since we have you here and you have a guitar and a band. Oh, yeah, why, might as well. What are you going to play? Uh, we will play Take My Side, track one. Might as well. Fantastic. OK, this is Will Butler and Band Live on BBC Six Music. Over to you. Yeah. 
brilliant. Will Butler, thank you so much. Thank you, guys. That was fantastic. Great to hear that song live. Um, OK, so tell me about the album. Policy It was recorded in just two weeks. Yeah, a week recording and a week mixing. Wow. So, like, I mean, a week then, that's, that's yeah. very, very fast. Did it feel quick or did it feel stressful? It sounds like it was fun to make yeah. when you listen to it. It's like making bagels. The fresher, the better. <laughs> <laughs> so you recorded in New York. Uh, tell me a bit about, you know, about the working process. How, how was it? Who were you with, you know? Uh, so I was recording with an engineer named Ben, ben Babti mm -hmm. at Electric Lady uh, Studios. Jimi Hendrix's studio, right? Jimi Hendrix's studio wow. in Jimi Hendrix's old living room. Because oh, wow. the basement is Studio A, where The Clash did The Magnificent Seven, <laughs> and David Bowie did Fame with John Lennon singing backing vocals, <laughs> and The Rolling Stones recorded. And Studio B is where D'Angelo lived for two years, like high out of his gourd, making voodoo. Wow. And then the third story was living quarters, and is more recent, there's a mixer named Tom Elmhurst who mixes there, who mm -hmm. mixes all, uh, an infinite number of amazing and records. you've worked with him before, right? He mixed Reflector for yeah, us. Yeah, yeah. And he, he doesn't use the live room, because uh, he just sits behind the glass and mixes. He was like, use my live room. Have Ben <laughs> record you. And I was like, great. And it's rugs and a piano and couches and a big window looking out onto the West Village where, every, like, DFA is two blocks away, and oh Bob Dylan used to live there, and wow. Paul Simon punched a guy in the throat in the corner right there. <laughs> I'm sure that is that is an apocryphal tale, yeah. I'm sure, Will. <laughs> um, wow, so that, that sounds like an incredible place to make a record. I would have spun it out a bit, though. Two weeks is, you know what I mean? I would have been like, I might be here <laughs> three, four weeks at least. So um, when it came to recording, uh, I love the, the thing that you talked about in the album, and, and you described the kind of humour in the record as slapstick mm -hmm. which just sounds perfect like in particular uh, the sixth track what i want it just you can hear you kind of like having fun in it tell, tell me about making that record because there's all sorts going on that track there's kind of group vocals and you know it's, it sounds like a very new york track as well yeah it's a very new york track uh so jeremy garrow was down jeremy garrow the arcade fire drummer was down we've played together for 10 years, so it's easy for us to play guitar and drums together, even though I'm much worse at guitar than he is at drums. <laughs> um, and yeah, so we just like bashed it out like in a couple takes, and we're like, sold! And then the backing vocals were, were pretty loosey-goosey. It was my wife and a uh, friend, Laurel Sprengelmeyer, who uh, goes by Little Scream, mm -hmm. who's amazing. Oh, mm -hmm. I love Little Scream! Yeah, yeah the, the Golden Record? Yeah, yeah. yeah amazing yeah, album. She, yeah. That's amazing. So, so she and Jenny just did like six passes of just like operatic backing vocals. Yes, because it, it sounds like a choir, so it's just yeah. two of them tracked up then. And we were just like, let's just see what it sounds like with everything up. And it was just like, <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a record. Sold. Yeah. So that, so to tell me about this, this word slapstick then, because uh, I, I totally get it hearing it, but, but kind of explain to me what you mean and why you wanted to bring that into the music or how it came out. I mean, I think part of it is... I describe it as an American record just out of accuracy, because I'm American. And kind of one of the foundational texts of America is Charlie Chaplin. It's like, he invented the movies, and at the same time, half of the films are like, where his pants fall down? And you're like, oh, ho, ho, that silly rabbit. Oh, no, wait, that's Looney Tunes. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, there's something really American about mixing high art and technique and really, really stupid jokes. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just part of my, it's always been a part of my method. I mean, even with Arcade Fire, particularly in the live show, yeah. there's a fair bit of literal slapstick comedy where it's like, if there was a rake there, you would step on the rake and it would hit you in the face. And you'd be like, oh, you <laughs> lousy rake. And, Why are you on a, I like this outside your bob, long yeah. gag, which is <laughs> loads of rakes. <laughs> Okay, well, it's it's great to hear that in, in the music. Um, so you guys grew up in, in a very musical household. Um, what kind of what kind of music was in the house when you were a kid? My parents didn't put on a lot of music. We listened to music when we ate dinner. We would mm -hmm. listen to like guitar, Bach, and things like that. But my mom played a lot of music. She's a she's primarily a jazz harpist, mm -hmm. um, but also a classical harpist and a rock and roll pianist. So she would be like, she would like play the blues and sing the blues, and she was a a songwriter as well, and she would be writing albums, and so there's like a lot of Debussy and the blues, and 
all, all sorts of things and and like Spanish classical music. And, wow, uh, so some good foundations. Yeah. At what point did you start kind of carving out your own musical identity? And and because that you know there's something kind of iconoclastic about that that you're describing, and of course that's right about American culture, but I think it's also right part of a very important part of your music is mm -hmm. to build this thing up and then kind of undercut it somehow. So, you know, at, at what point did you? What was your kind of gateway musical? Drug. <laughs> I mean, I kind of did three phases. I did my childhood. Like, I didn't listen to the radio. I've never actually listened to the radio. Well, commercial radio, which is different. Um, but I didn't really listen to rock and roll music till I was 16 or so. I listened to a lot of classical music. I listened to jazz. I listened to whatever. And then uh, kind of 16 to 22 would be my British period. Oh, yeah. It would be the Smiths, the Cure, Radiohead. Well, Radiohead. Sad British pop music. Bjork, who's not obviously not British, but, you know, she's kind of British. Uh, <laughs> she's, and, uh, she's, she lived here for a bit. Yeah. Yeah. And, then, uh, and then after that, kind of in college, it was, it was more an education in deep weirdo music. It was like I was working at the radio station. Yeah, you like, had a show, right? Yeah. So you went from never listening to the radio to having your own show. Yeah. But it was very strict. It was all student run. You're like, oh, I'm going to play the Velvet Underground. And they're like, that is way too mainstream. You can play John <laughs> Cale if you must, <laughs> but you have to play one of his less popular albums. <laughs> Like, maybe play the one that he did with Terry Riley, The Church of Anthrax, the third track, <laughs> Ides of March. It's really beautiful. It's like 12 minutes. Yeah. Oh, I can so <laughs> identify with that. I think I remember when I was 15, almost losing my hearing the day before my Spanish listening exam because I'd been to see Truman's Water <laughs> live. And I often think back, what would that girl have made of me now? She would think I was a terrible sellout. Um, so so that, was, that was your in, was that kind of very underground... Uh, sort of music. Okay, great, good to know. Um, so, when it comes to the the solo stuff, I mean, is this uh, going to be an ongoing project for you? Because you've got this fantastic band as well. Who, you know, we haven't even mentioned. I mean, where did these guys come from? They came from New York. <laughs> uh, that that one there. That one there in the corner, yeah. That one yes, is her. my wife's sister, who's a very talented musician. That one was anybody's in West Side Story. <laughs> <laughs> and that one played drums with Antiballas and plays drums a million things. Oh, but we, wow. we played shows with Antiballas and it, it was we got along swimmingly. <laughs> and they're all they all live in New York. Kind of, I kind of live in New York now. Well, it's kinda. fantastic. It's also well, it's so good to see that you know your success hasn't gone to your head when it comes to working <laughs> with, working with your bandmates and those kind of uh, relationships. Yeah. It's great. It's still, kind of really humble. It's good. Good yeah, to see. Yeah. These people <laughs> are so wonderful. <laughs> So seriously, though, I mean, you know, I, I think this is a, an experience that you might like to repeat because you say, you know, the, the recording was fun and it's obvious that you're kind of having fun playing the music live. Yeah, definitely. I was originally going to straight away uh, after this tour, after this little Europe tour, stay in London and work with Marcus Drabs for a couple of weeks. Oh, cool. But that's that's crazy. I'm way too tired for that. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, but there'll be another album at some point. It kind of depends on what Arcade Fire does. Okay. It's a pretty satisfying day job. Yeah. Yes, you know, but this is also a pretty satisfying day job. That's too many day jobs. No, oh, man. <laughs> this is, well, l at least, uh, you know, the, all the music is good. It's, uh, it's great to have you here. Will Butler, thank you so much. We're going to have more music from you guys in a bit. I'm in the live room once more with Will Butler and band. Thank you very much for sticking with us. Um, so, Will, you're touring at the minute, and obviously the, the, well, not obviously, but obviously to you, the last time that we met each other was straight off stage at Glastonbury Festival last summer when you just headlined. It was an incredible show, that. I mean, can you, can you remember much about it? Because I know you were in the middle of that huge world tour. Uh, I remember the aftermath quite clearly from the interview <laughs> onward. But no, the show the show is very good. I remember that Metallica had the big wings on the stage, and I was trying to figure out how to jump onto them because <laughs> I wanted to use them. But they were like, "You can't use them." I was like, "But I want to use them." Metallica has wings you can run on. <laughs> Dude, don't touch Metallica's wings. I try. I touched one of them. I. I I tried to bound across the stage to the other, but the song was too short. Oh, damn it. Yeah. So near and yet so far. So far. I, th I love that this implies that Metallica have a wing roadie as well, <laughs> which is quite an amazing thing. I mean, uh, you know, the whole the props thing, you know, you've got quite a few of those with Arcade Fire yourselves at the moment. Really kind of spectacular tour to support Reflector. I wonder whether, um, you know, playing big venues at Madison Square Garden and those huge kind of stadium shows that you guys do, does that change the kind of record that you make? Because you have have the those huge spaces to fill the sound and you know to bring the kind of stagecraft in and all that stuff it only changes the kind of record 
in that after playing those shows, you learn something more about humanity that you didn't know before, like and what? that influences your art. <laughs> <laughs> but like what? What kind of thing? No, just you. Just when you see, you just. Uh, it's just a different experience playing to that many people and seeing how they respond to the music. And you don't you don't intentionally go into another record, like I'm going to make it so the the twelve thousand person person can feel this, but. After that experience, it's part of your toolkit. We're like, oh, and that's yeah. what happens when the drums happen. You're like, oh, right, I remember that. I think um, Caribou was talking about that when he was in, Dan Snaith was in a few months ago, and he was talking about, funnily enough, touring with Radiohead, who obviously we just played, and, and, and saying that, you know, that when he did that, it's, it is that thing, as you say, just seeing that amount of people and what they respond to and what they react to, it sort of opens another another door and i wonder whether um you know doing the solo album is is a bit of a chance to kind of do something that's different to that or that's you know parallel to that a little bit though even on the reflector tour we started off by playing 200 person rooms and 1000 person rooms um it's more it's almost more playing less the room size and more just the amount of new music that we're playing because the record's only a month old mm -hmm. and that's about a half hour of the show mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other half of the show is just completely new music that nobody's ever heard before. Okay, so, so you can, like, look people in the eyes and be like, how do you like this one, huh? <laughs> and how do they like it? Are they? Do you get, like, good eyes back? Uh, They're smizing back at you? Hopefully not too good eyes back. Okay. Sometimes you're like, oh, no, I just saw into your soul. <laughs> next song, next song, quickly. So, that, so you've got more stuff ready to go, more um, solo stuff ready to go at some point? Yeah, okay. at some point. Do you write every day? Oh Lord, no! But you, you, you're always working a little bit, and it, everyone always has a phone with a recording device on it. So you're like, oh, an idea. We button what up? I'm using it in your phone, and then you like type down a lyric That's idea. That's actually and you just sang Scatman John and <laughs> yeah. his hit. So just to just FYI, do I, don't try do and release that because that's already been a been a <laughs> single. No, it's an idea. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but do I owe do I owe somebody like forty pence now? Uh, no, it's okay. As long as it's under thirty seconds, you're right. fine, and nobody if actually knows. More nobody than knows seconds. up to nobody knows thirty seconds of that song. That's the only bit that anybody knows. Don't give me that. You know it. No, you don't know it. <laughs> that one. I thought that one knew it. Um, so uh, you uh, you also worked with David Bowie on uh, Reflector. Now you've described um, Mr. Bowie as the best smelling human I ever met. Correct. I am going to require some more adjectives. You <laughs> well, I'll I'll try to describe a scene rather than using more adjectives. Okay. Oh, but you want more adjectives about him as a human, as not, him as not, a... not him as he smells. Oh, both. I okay. I was think to be honest, I was olfactory. I was yeah. going for the well, smell. Because you like but... walk into a room and you're like, something's different. I'm in a different dimension. Like, it smells so good in here. <laughs> and you're like, oh, David Bowie's here. And then you're like, oh, hi, hello. And he's like, hello, Will. And you're like, oh. Wow. He knows my name. <laughs> <laughs> so then you're obviously, yeah, at that point, overcome by the emotion of, of being in the same room as David Bowie. So what, just to take you back to the smell, mm -hmm. Will, how, how would you describe the, the smell of David Bowie, that, that wonderful smell? It smelled like uh, if an ancient pine forest had a massive forest fire, but like, a month ago, so you still get the new growth oh, of the grass green and the moisture, but there's still there's a there's an undercurrent of pain, but also of smoke. So it's like kind of like marshmallows. <laughs> wow, yeah. it's just like That's a powerful. Patrick Suskind novel of some kind. <laughs> How wonderful! Um, w will you be reprising that that working relationship uh, at any point? I mean, you know, what do you think? You, you obviously now have connections at Electric uh, Lady Studios mm -hmm. where where Bowie's worked. Uh, we'd happily do it. I mean, he, he chooses to relate to us as fellow musicians, as like, as peers. You're like, oh, okay, if you're calling me a peer, then sure, we're peers. I'll, I'll do that. I'm your peer, David Bowie. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it, it feels very comfortable. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, it's a very comfortable and human relationship. Obviously, you've got a lot going on at the minute. You know, we've talked already about the film score and the Oscar nomination, the solo album and Arcade Fire. What, what's next in the diary after after this album and, and kind of supporting the new record is, is done? Uh, summer off. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm going to take the summer off. And by summer off, I mean like singing the Scatman into my phone and writing down <laughs> their ideas. Uh, 
and then depends a bit on the fall. I'll, I'll probably start on a new album in the fall, but maybe Arcade Fire will start on a new album. But yeah. Who knows when that'll actually happen? But uh, yeah, the, the fall, back to school time, we'll be back to work time. We'll okay. figure it out. Play some more shows in the fall, but not a, not a full on tour because I'm far too lazy for such work. Well, listen, it's, it's been brilliant to have you here. We're going to let you uh, wend your merry way to the, to the next show, which I know is uh, London tonight. Um, what are you going to play us before you go? We will play Anna. Oh, yes, please. Will Butler live on BBC Six Music. Over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. That was just brilliant. Have a fantastic show tonight and, you know, happy trails for the rest of the tour. Wish you the very best of luck with it. Thanks for joining us today.